Hi, I'm Shannon Nelson. With me today, high realist wildlife artist, Daniel Taylor. Daniel Taylor's current project, Art for Africa, When Paintings Come Alive, is designed to raise awareness and funds for wildlife conservation and education of school children. For this purpose, he's partnered with the African Conservation Foundation. High realism painting is the perfect medium for expressing the beauty of Africa and for highlighting the need to support these worthwhile causes. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you, Shannon. So, not just a wildlife artist, a high realist wildlife artist. A uh, very high realist artist, meaning when I do a painting of uh, whatever it may be, an animal or a person, uh, it looks almost exactly, uh, well not exactly, but very close to a photograph, very, very realistic looking, and try to make it as accurate as possible. Okay, so um, would someone like Robert Bateman be a high realist wildlife artist well? As well, he's considered as a realist artist. Um, I, I go a step probably beyond that where my work will look even that much more closer to how the, the image I'm looking at would, would should look, at least in my mind, how I perceive it. Right. Yeah. Okay, so now are you able to accomplish that because you use acrylic paint? Well, acrylic is, is very pliable uh, because it's very fast drying. Yeah, I am able to make it look as real as possible. I'm able to bring it to the conclusion that I want to show it as, and so yeah, yeah, very much so. Because it, that's tricky to work with, acrylic paint. I've heard, I don't know. It can, it can be. Acrylic paint, um, again, because it's very uh, quick and dry, and it allows myself anyways to be able to get that intricate work I need to get in there. Um, a, you can paint it like an oil. You can have a, a, a form of, of painting it so that um, it'll come out looking uh, very rich looking. But again, with the high real estate that I do, I need that very slow dry or very fast drying type of uh, medium to create the animal or the or the person w that I'm painting in that. So because the acrylic paint is fast drying, does, does that mean that you have to be pretty quick about sort of creating this work, or do you do it in, in tiny little pieces? Well, the nicest part about it is, is being such fast drying paint, I'm able to take my time. In fact, I can even put my hand rubbing across the painting itself and not worry about getting it on my hands and smudging the painting and that. Right. So it comes out looking pretty good, pretty good. Are there many, um, wildlife artists, high realist wildlife artists who use acrylic? Uh, apparently there are. There, there's a good number of them. It is a very difficult medium to master. Right. Um, and because I've done this for oh, about 20 some odd years now, I pretty well got it down pat. I understand how to, how to manipulate the, the paint itself and, and apply it to the canvas or to, in my case, to the, the illustration board. Okay. So. so you and your wife Jeanette have been on quite an, ex an adventure. Oh, an amazing adventure. All right, so um, tell me f uh, about the Art for Africa Cameroon project. Well, that was brought to us through the African Conservation Foundation. Um, they are uh, an amazing uh, foundation where we were, we were actually doing some work for them before of endangered species, and I've done carnivores and that sort of thing. Um, they did bring to me about uh, the Cross River Grella. It's the most extremely uh, endangered grella in on the planet right and there's only 250 300 alive and they asked would I be interested in in doing a picture of the cross river grella and to be able to bring uh, a greater awareness to the the animal right. but again this animal in particular because it's so near to extinction uh, we wanted to make it more um, more I guess in public awareness, wanted to bring it more out there to, to show the public just how dire the need is to help these uh, amazing animals. Okay, so um, what are the pressures that have been put on these animals? Why are there so few of them? What's been happening? Well, in the Cameroon, in the, in the Levelian Highlands where we were, um, the land concessions or the logging concessions, they're, they're pushing the grellas further and further back into areas where they shouldn't be. And of course, then they have the um, the, uh, the farmlands that are also pushing them in as well. Mm -hmm. And these animals, they have to be close together. They have to be near each other in order to to continue on with with uh, with, with the species and that. Uh, the grella will have maybe will have only uh, one baby uh, every three years. Wow, they're not even as pro prolific as we are. No, not at all. Holy. No. 
Hmm. All right, and, and I understand that poaching is a bit of a problem. Very, very much so. In fact, the fellow that took us down there, his name was Playboy, at least we called him Playboy. Um, he used to be a poacher, and uh, again, he took us down to the Lebanon Highlands. Now, we're talking about an area that goes almost straight down like that. Yeah. And uh, that was probably about five to seven kilometers straight down. Of course, we had to come back the same way. And the poachers in the area, of course, are still carrying on that way, and the hunters as well. They do need their bush meat. They need to carry this on to feed their families. And, they, and again, like Playboy, they have great families. They have many, many kids. In his case, I think he had about 30 to 40 children. Wow. Same wife, I hope not. <laughs> no. Not that many no, kids. No. So they're, they're actually, they're hunting these animals for food. Hunting for food. Uh, the wonderful thing is that we do have a solution that we're able to help these people with. Um, we, we are offering um, a way of domesticating animals, domesticated animals, uh, as well as helping the, these poachers or the hunters to become, let's say, uh, guides or rangers and that sort of thing within the jungles and that, and to be able to, to uh, offset what they need, of course, within in the finances and that to feed their families. Because mm -hmm. the poaching is yeah. illegal, isn't it? Definitely illegal. All yeah. right, now I, I read that you actually met up with some poachers mm. and you snuck a camera. You had a, a camera in your shirt? Well, yeah, we came across along a roadside where they were, were selling these uh, illegally uh, dead uh, monkeys on sticks hanging from strings and that. Okay, now I got to stop you right there and say, what did it feel like to see that? Well, we were shocked at first, of course, uh, but we were pretending we were tourist people, unbeknownst to them that we are involved in conservation. Right. And then to actually see this, um, we more or less turned our head this way and that way, talking to them, asking if we could take pictures of it. Mm -hmm. uh, they asked for us to pay them for it. Um, eventually, they did allow us to take some pictures in that. He uh, let on who we were, and that's when they had their machetes and that, and we thought, uh-oh, now we're in trouble. No kidding. In the meantime, I still had my little camera on me, and I was videotaping what was happening. And so we had a uh, chance of reprises there. So it was quickly like, um, thank you very much. And it was nice talking to you. Goodbye. In a big and hurry. And we hurried back to the truck, and that was that. Now, you were there with your wife. Was she there when, when that happened? Yeah. In fact, she came out to see what was happening with us and that. And she was quite distraught to see these, these monkeys, of course, hanging from the sticks and that. And she started saying, well, these are dead monkeys, and what's happening here, and this is terrible. And I kept putting my hand up, like, sh you know, yeah. go back to the truck because th there's a problem happening. That, so she understood quite well, and she went right back to the truck, and, and uh, that was it. And we made haste, and off we went. That your heart was a pounding. Definitely, yeah. yeah. The reaction from the chiefs that you met—they're called fawns, right? No, that's right. Well, actually, the chiefs are our chiefs, and the fawn is a king. Oh, okay. And we met uh, with numerous kings, but in this case we had to go before an assembly of, of chiefs and that. Uh, I can't recall how many chiefs there were, but it was, it was quite a heated debate on, on why we were there yeah. and whom we were and that sort of thing and why we wanted to go in through the area that we were at. Uh, in the Fosimonde area, um, we needed to go to find the grellas uh, because this was basically in the grid area that we needed to, to see if we could catch up with them. Um, through the heated debate, they weren't quite sure if they should let us and, and, uh, and whatnot, but in the end, it was more or less agreed upon until the following day when we were actually turned down because the king was not uh, approving us going in through his area. Right. Hmm. So we had to make track and go actually an opposite way, which was very uh, difficult, and as I say, it was straight on down. Yeah. And, yeah. But you had to respect what the king's... I had to respect, but it's too bad because we did offer him that solution where he, he could look after his villages and, and that sort of thing. And, and um, he wasn't for it. He just hmm. thought, you know. Afraid of change. I don't know if he was so much afraid of change. It's more of um, he, I, he wasn't too sure exactly what we were about. Right. And, uh, and they have to be, you have to respect them, of course, too, as well. Mm -hmm. And again, because of the solution that we do have, it's, it's offering help to the people and again to the poachers and hunters to become rangers and that sort of thing and to the families and the, and the villages there. And in fact, there's 11 villages that we need to look after and uh, having the prints from the, the, from the sale of the Cross River Grill and that, the finances from that go directly to help the Cross River Grill and of course within those areas as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, now um, let's talk a little bit about stalking the gorillas because mm. they move pretty quickly. Very quickly. In fact, just the smell of a human 
or just the, the crack of a branch, they're off. And there are so many steps ahead of us. Uh, in the end, we only saw markings of the gorilla. We saw their nestings up in the tree. Uh, actually, the male, he'll build a nest way up high in the tree for the female and the baby to sleep, and he'll sleep below. Hmm. So we would see the nest, of course, up in the tree, and of course, the, the grass where he had laid down below the tree. But no, we couldn't find the gorilla, and it truly is a silent jungle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you were led by a former poacher, mm -hmm. you say. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, was there, did you have any conflict around that? No, uh, because we do understand they are there to, uh, poachers aren't necessarily bad. They're, yeah. they're there to feed their families. And like any of us, they're trying to survive. They're trying to make these things happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so, no, he, he was very helpful and very understanding, as we were with him. Mm -hmm. And we actually were very fortunate because this man does know the area, obviously, quite well, and he's able to take us down through these levels and that. Now, did you sleep over in this habitat? Yeah, we did, yeah. Pretty yeah. uncomfortable. Well, we were soaking wet because coming down, once again, coming down through that area there, uh, we had quite a downpour. And of course, the canopy there is, is quite heavy, so you have raindrops coming down like this. And we were just soaked from head to foot. And when evening uh, comes in, then it draws, draws close, is chilly. Mm -hmm. And of course, you're soaking wet. And even the clothes that you have in your pack set are damp. Yeah. And you change into those. And you're, you're still shivering. Yeah. But yeah, we had her tent and we slept in there. And yeah. But well, you had your wife with you, so you weren't. Well, she kept me comfortable, to be sure. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Um, there was an educational component to what you did. Tell me about that, because you actually taught some art classes. Oh, yeah, that was amazing in itself. Um, one of, the, the, one of the, the, the parts of the expedition was to actually teach in three different schools. And these are very, very remote areas in schools, of course, being, being uh, not like the schools you have here. These are buildings that look like they shouldn't even be inhabited. Mm -hmm. And anyways, we taught um, about the Cross River Grella and the, the other primates around these kids that don't even know they exist. And prior to actually teaching the school, what they would do is they would draw a picture of the grill that I would teach. And that they would have to go to the king's palace. And in one case, they had to travel two kilometers through the heat and humidity up and through these roads and that to get to the palace and see a film that we presented to them. And I mean, these kids are just crashed in there once they're allowed in, about 40, 50, 60 kids, whatever wow. it was. And then come back to the king's palace again, follow all up through the two, two, two kilometers there, back to the school. And I would stand in front of the class and draw a very simple picture of a gorilla, and then they would copy. And all the art materials that they had, we brought with us from Canada, mm -hmm. and they were able to use that. And uh, yeah, it was just an amazing time for educational part. Um, in order to save the gorilla, everyone has to be taken care of. For sure. Okay, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, when you're offering, uh, in this case, we're offering to, to help them with uh, domesticated animals, and, that. and of course, finances needed for that. Right. And once they have, let's say, the king rat, uh, or the cane rat, and it's a fair size, it almost looks like a mole, it's a fair size animal. To and eat. To eat, yeah, it's a domesticated animal. Yeah. And then they have the porcupine, and not much unlike our porcupine. And then they ha have the uh, various uh, medicinal plants and, and seeds of that sort. And all this needs to be supplied and, ha and to help them with. And of course, they're able to use that rather than go out, going out and hunting these animals for uh, for for meat for right. protein. All right. Um, I've read that you try to use your painting, and you have historically tried to use your painting um, to promote causes. Right. And and this is obviously something that is near and dear to your heart. Right. Have there been others before this? Others. Causes. Uh, well, the causes before this. Um, I was doing a program for a good number of years through the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Um, I was appointed uh, through that through um, uh, Michael Harcourt, then Premier, mm -hmm. as well as uh, uh, Bush Senior. Mm. And so it was an amazing privilege to be able to use the arts to help benefit the handicapped uh, people and, and the kids. And we actually started some workshops here and around the world to help benefit them using the arts. We got to talk a little bit about you, the artist, now, um, and not the causes. So, when when did you start drawing? Ooh, since I was a wee lad. Yeah. Um, I, I've been painting for since uh, as long as I can remember. What were you painting but in those early days? Oh, in those very very early days, when yeah. I was a little fella. Oh, I was, I was actually doing little sketches of, let's say, uh, King Tut. Ah. And you know, I was only about three, four, four years old, five years old, and carried on like that. And 
And uh, in fact, it was hard for me to keep my mind on the studies in class and, uh, and how many times I was told to, to do the work in class other than draw. Yeah. And of course, that, that proceeded into doing the work that I, that I do now. And uh, I got seriously involved in um, painting probably when I was probably about uh, 14, 15 years old. Do you remember the first painting you sold? Yeah, it was actually of a uh, chic. Ah. Yeah, so. And, and where is that painting now? Uh, actually, I don't know. Yeah. Do you, are you able to just let go of them like that when you sell a painting? Yeah, yeah. It's just yeah. okay, it's gone now. I There's no problem. No they're problem. not. They're, they're like children. That they're, you gone, they're gone. <laughs> they're gone. They're gone. You want picture, them to be gone. gone. <laughs> yeah, pretty well. Right. Um, all right. Now you were self-taught. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. So never took any art classes, anything like that. Um, no. Well, um, I remember in high school, of course, you had to take art. Yeah. And I wouldn't draw. I wouldn't copy the teacher. Not not to be obstinate. Just simply because I understood what he was talking about. So he would just say, "Well, you know, look, don't even show up for class. Just go to the library. Whatever you're going to do." Uh, go to the gym, it doesn't matter because we'll pass you anyways. And that was on the sly. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it, there was no problem. Now you've done some portraits. Yeah, I have. You did Michael Landon. I did too. Why yeah. did you choose him? Well, I did that for his daughter, for Cheryl. And I, from what I understand, Cheryl used that in one of her books. That I'm not too sure of. And she's quite pleased with it. And she, yeah, she thought it was amazing. I also did one for uh, former movie star, his name was Peter Brett. Uh, I don't know if you recall The Big Belly and oh, yeah. Bonanza and that. Yeah. I think his name was Nick. He was with Barbara Stanwyck and, and oh, so, right. so forth. Anyways, talking to Peter, I got in touch uh, with Peter through Red Robinson, who's a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. um, Red um, suggested talking to Peter about the programs that he had, which in his case it was to do with leukemia. Ah. Uh, his son, uh, Chris, ha had passed away through leukemia. Yeah. So I asked Peter if I could do a portrait of him in, in his cowboy garb and that. And then after doing that, uh, then used prints that he would create there out and uh, for leukemia. And our daughter has diabetes mm -hmm. and for society, to help the Society for Diabetes as well. And so he would go and uh, display this, this print that it, of himself and that and all the proceeds go toward those two societies. So. That's kind of nice that, yeah. that you can use those prints to raise money for, for different organizations. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're, you're benefiting other people other than just creating artwork to hang on your own wall at home. Yeah. You're, you're doing it for other causes and other people. In this case, we're doing this for, for the people in Africa, uh, down the Cameroon, and of course for the endangered species. Yeah, so now so. You've, you've actually created a t-shirt for the Cameroon Project we have, yeah. um, that people can buy and the funds from that go to this... Goes directly toward helping the, the uh, gorillas down there. Okay, um, about the process of painting. How long, I hate to nail you down because I'm sure it's different for every painting, right. but how long from beginning to finished project? Well, in the case of the one I did of the lowland gorilla, that takes anywhere from three to five months to create. That's a long time. It's a long time. Uh, the you ever get sick of them? Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> near the end, you can't wait to be done. Yeah. You, <laughs> but you, when I did the Cross River Gorilla, that took it probably about uh, only about two months. Right. Uh, the reason for that is because the need is so great for the Cross River Gorilla, and we're talking only about th between three and five years before they're extinct. Um, I can't express how badly they need the finances and that, in, in order to carry this out. Um, anyone that, that's out there that's looking for a cause or an interest to be able to, to help, then this is the one here because this is so much in, in dire need right now. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm getting the feeling that um, this trip that you made with your mm -hmm. wife to Africa changed you. Very much so. It changed both Jeanette and I uh, in respect that we were able to see how life was there, how the people were. We actually lived within the villages and that. Mm -hmm. um, we ate our own food there. You can't eat the food that you have there. Why not? Uh, you get sick. Okay. Um, and actually, I did eat one meal, which I shouldn't have, and I paid very, very dearly for that. Oh. And uh, But living within the villages and going through the areas and just to have the smells and, and the atmosphere living in the areas just gives you a totally different perspective on how you perceive things other than before when you're leaving to the Cameroon and that. Yeah. yeah. Think you'll go back? I would love to. I would love to. To yeah. paint some more? Maybe you'll actually spot that? Gorilla? Uh, well, I doubt if I'll spot it. Um, to to s to go back there again, uh, I would like to see it, the programs that we have actually put in place, mm -hmm. and that would be nice. 
Um, there is one and only one uh, cross river grill in captivity. Her name is Niango, and she's about eight, 18 years old. And she's in the Limbe Wildlife Conservation Center there. Right. And she's a beautiful, beautiful animal. And uh, the sad thing is, of course, she's the, uh, about to become one of her last of her kind. And yeah. That's it. And she's alone in that place. And she's alone, yeah. 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 I hope you get a chance to go back, Daniel. I, I'm sure I will. I'm sure we will. And thank you for sitting down with us today. Thank you, too.